Hello there, and welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper, and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring. Before we get into the crime, let's talk a little bit about the coloring. So get comfy, and let's get crafty. This week I have selected three stamp sets, two lawn fawn, robots, and dinosaurs, and one astronauts from My Favorite Things. I will be stamping these images on a half of a sheet of Bristol Smooth cardstock. This cardstock comes in a 9 by 12 inch pad, so this piece is 6 by 9 inches. It is a little bit tall for my Misty, but that will not interfere with me being able to stamp these images properly. Once I get that cardstock all lined up and tucked down into my bottom left hand corner, I'm going to go ahead and zoom through the placement of the stamped images on this cardstock. I am using Bristol cardstock because I want to use my Zig clean color real brush markers today. These are a watercolor medium and I've heard through the grapevine that Bristol paper is the best paper to use um, when you use these markers. So I'm going to try it out. It is not my best coloring medium because I don't use it often enough. I will go ahead and ink up all of my stamps with the Versaclair Nocturne ink. Nocturne black ink, something like that. This is a waterproof ink, so it is perfect when I'm using a watercoloring medium. So once I've got them all inked up, I will go ahead and stamp them down. I am going to leave the stamps in my Misty because I'm going to be using my Scan and Cut to cut them out. Um, this little pouch is where I store my clean my Zig markers. It is I came, got it from Amazon. It came three to a bag. Super cool. Um, I am going to be cutting these images out with my scan and cut, like I mentioned before. If you want to see a video on how I use my brother's scan and cut to um, cut out stamped images, leave me a comment down below. 100% I would love to do that for you. A little bit on the coloring. These are a wet medium, so I am starting with the darkest color and blending out with a lighter color and then also bringing in a clear, um, it's a, a blending pen. Um, trying to go ahead and get those shadows and the highlights and that's pretty much where we are. So let's get into the crime part. All right. So now that we have talked about the coloring, oh, one more thing. If you want to see a video of how I use my scan and cut to cut stamped images, leave me a comment down below. 100% I will do that video. It is probably the most expensive item in my craft room. I don't know. It ties with my Cricut. But I, I find that I use it often because then I can have more money for stamps and I don't have to worry about coordinating dies. Okay, so now that we've talked about the coloring and the scan and cut, we're going to go ahead and move into the crime. Our state this week, alphabetically, is California. Um, California was around a long time. There was no official territorial organization prior to statehood, so it was run through a military authority, especially from 1948 until California was granted statehood in 1950. Um, because of the gold rush and a lot of the expansion west, there was a lot of crime, and California truly was part of the Wild West. Because of the lawlessness of the time period, many stories and criminals and crimes were born in this era, including Tom Bell, the very first stagecoach robber. Tom Bell was actually born Thomas J. Hodges, and he was born either in Rome, Tennessee, or somewhere in Alabama. I found records um, citing both. He was born sometime around 1826. And here's the kicker. His parents are unknown, but it is assumed that he was from an upstanding family because he received a good education, went to medical school, medical school, and became a surgeon. I'm wondering if Thomas J. Hodges was also a pseudonym because I can't find a birth certificate. Just my thoughts. Hodges was said to have stood over six feet tall, had blue eyes, sandy hair, and a blonde mustache and a goatee. He was known for natural leadership abilities, and people were drawn to him. He joined the army and fought in the Mexican-American War. He saw battle as a military surgeon, served honorably as a non-commissioned officer, and became an expert with a rifle and a bayonet. 
Following the war, he traveled to California to a, to attempt his hand at um, prospecting during the gold rushes, the gold rush time. But he was not successful as a prospector. He drifted around California. He used his skills as a doctor or a surgeon, but he was also a gambler and not necessarily an honest gambler. He was a little bit of a tricky kind of guy. In 1855, the outlaw, Doc Hodges, he had already created a name as being an outlaw, was arrested for stealing 11 mules. And in these days, stealing horses, mules, livestock, that, that were hanging offenses. He stole 11 mules and he sold them for a profit. But when the peace officers, so he was arrested, okay, and the peace officers asked for his name, he told them his name was Tom Bell. So Hodges was clever, and he had heard of, in his um, criminal dealings, of a small-time cattle thief by the name of Tom Bell. So he decided to confuse the police and, gave him that, and give them that name, and it worked. The judge had no idea that Hodges was actually a violent road agent, a.k.a. a bandit. Okay. In 1855, the court sended Hodges, a.k.a. Bell, to a five-year prison term at Angel Island. This was a prison outside of San Francisco. Shortly after his arrival, however, Hodges put his medical training to good use. He feigned a severe illness and convinced the prison doctor that he was too sick to remain incarcerated on the island, so he was transferred to a prison in San Francisco. While in this prison, he met another outlaw named Bill Gristy. And sometime later, along with two other men, Nen Connor and Jill, Jim Smith, they escaped prison. And they formed an outlaw gang. By the spring and summer of 1856, they regularly robbed lone travelers, mercantiles, saloons, cattle ranchers, pack trains, and wagons traveling through the gold rush camps in the Sierra Nevadas. Hodges and his band of thieves robbed anyone they caught on the road. Nobody was safe. In early 1856, a freight driver, Dutch John, was stopped by five armed men who demanded a contribution. They, he was, they were not going to allow him to pass unless he paid them for the privilege. Dutch John was hauling a cargo of beer to the small community of Dry Town, and the bandits weren't thirsty. These highwaymen took Dutch's $30 and told him to hit the road. Despite all the bold and frequent holdups, the lawmen seemed helpless in their efforts to catch Hodges and his boys. Ordinary citizens were getting fed up with the crime wave, and Mr. Woods, a toll collector for the bridge on the south fork of Yuba River, was the next victim. One day, three horsemen rode past him without paying the toll, saying that members of Tom Bell's gang didn't pay toll to anyone. Woods was not the kind of man to take that without a fight, so he got his rifle and fired shots at the men and then pursued them for several miles. A small posse joined the chase, but the bandits disappeared into the forest and escaped. Hodges and his band, his gang, were having some success as road agents, but Hodges himself was growing weary of the small-time hits on Teamsters and beer merchants. He wanted a big payout. No one had yet robbed a stagecoach carrying a Wells Fargo treasure chest full of coin or bullion, so Hodges decided he would be the first. While planning the big heist, Hodges reined in his henchmen, and the gang laid low. With the robbers hiding out for that summer of 1856, it was very criminally quiet in that part of the country. However, here comes the big butt, right? That peace was shattered on August 12, 1856. Early that morning, the Marysville stagecoach pulled out of Camp... Camptonville loaded with passengers and a strong box filled with $100,000 in gold. Today's money, that's about a million eight hundred and seventeen thousand eight hundred and fifty-eight dollars 
Next to the driver, the express company had an armed guard. The gold was owned by a Comptonville gold dust dealer named Mr. Rideout. There had never been a California stagecoach robbery, but Rideout wasn't taking any chances, and he rode his horse out in front of the stagecoach. On the way to Marysville, Rideout decided to take a little used fork in the road, which spooked three masked men hiding in the brush. Foolishly, Rideout had failed to arm himself and was ordered to dismount. The bandit searched his pockets, took his horse, and rode off. Mr. Rideout quickly ran back to the main road, which he reached just as gunfire erupted in the hot afternoon air. Hodges and two of his accomplices had ambushed the stage, but their carefully planned heist was disrupted. Hodges had assigned six armed men on horseback for this job, three converging on each side of the stage. Rideout's unexpected appearance had thrown off their timing, and with the attack coming from only one side, the armed guard was able to blast one bandit with his first shot. At that, Hodges and his men opened fire, riddling the stage with bullets. Several passengers inside the coach produced their own weapons, and a firefight ensued. Forty shots were fired within the first two minutes. The, the withering barrage forced Hodges and his wounded men to retreat into the brush, while Dobson, the stagecoach um, guard, commanded the driver to race on toward Marysville. Just then, the three delayed gang members galloped up the road with Rideout's horse in tow. Despite a bullet wound to his right arm, the guard was ready for them. His first shot sent the lead rider tumbling into the dust. The other two bandits took off and Rideout was able to grab his horse and ride off after the speeding stagecoach. The slain female passenger was a woman by the name of Mrs. Tilgman. She was the wife of a very popular barber from Marysville. The robbery and death of a woman passenger angered the citizens, and both the sheriff's posse at a, and a citizen vigilante group conducted a massive search for the gang. The gangster showed no remorse and wrote a letter taunting those searching for him, in which he said, catch me if you can. The chase now was on, right? Who's going to take that? And one by one, Hodge's gang members were either caught or killed. By late September, Gristy was captured. And under the threat of being turned over to an irate lynch mob outside the jail, he revealed the location where Hodges was hiding. In early October, a posse led by Judge Belt ambushed Thomas Hodges at his secluded camp near the San Joaquin River. The judge's posse had their guns pointed at Hodges, and when he was told he was the person they had been looking for, he replied very calmly, very probably. Once Hodges was caught and disarmed, a rider was sent for the sheriff. But when it came to justice for Thomas Hodges, a.k.a. Tom Bell, Judge Belt took the law into his own hands. Apparently, the judge felt that Thomas was not deserving of due justice of the law, but instead deserved the lack of mercy he had shown to his victims. 26-year-old Thomas Hodges was given a few minutes to write letters. He wrote one letter to his mother and one letter to a hotel owner in town. Those letters were later published in a local newspaper. The letter to his mother was short and read, Dear Mother, as I am about to make my exit to another country, I take this opportunity to write you a few lines. Probably you may never hear from me again. If not, I hope we meet where parting is no more. So this is why I wonder if Thomas J. Hodges was an alias that he used when he joined the army. Um, he knew, he, he assumed rather, that his mother would see this letter. So somehow she was an unknown person, to him at least. Anyway, the second letter was addressed to a Mrs. Elizabeth Hood. Hodges had stayed at her hotel from time to time, 
Um, she kind of helped him hide out occasionally. She had three daughters, and there was a rumor that Hodges was romantically involved with her oldest daughter, something that Mrs. Hood publicly um, denounced. In his letter, in addition to offering his final farewell, that word is really hard, farewell, Hodges continued to declare his innocence. He stated he was not guilty of the crimes of robbery he was being charged with. He worried that because he was being condemned to die like a dog, that her family would be affected. He, he said he was concerned for her family's condition due to their friendship. Hodges then told Elizabeth it would be best to take her daughters or send her daughters to San Francisco to be educated and protected. And then he admonished all three girls to be careful with whom they attached themselves to. He had $10 remaining on his person and he entrusted it to one of the members of the mob and told him it was to be given to Sarah, Mrs. Hood's oldest daughter. Ten minutes after writing and signing his letters, Thomas J. Hodges, a.k.a. Tom Bell, was swinging from a hemp rope. His life, just another footnote in the Sierra history. His murderous crime wave lasted only 18 months. Despite the lack of success that Thomas Hodges and his gang had, other robbers came behind them and were able to successfully pull off many stagecoach heists. I was able to find a couple of photos from the newspaper of Thomas Hodges and his crew and also the letter he wrote to his mother. He did sign it, your only boy, Tom. So there you go. Thank you so much for stopping by my channel today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Crime and Coloring. I have added a couple of other videos here for you to watch as well as a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed, I would love it if you did. Leave me a comment, leave me a thumbs up, and have a really fabulous day.